unions in America are on a decline. It's a fact. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, today only 11% of American workers are part of a union. That's a stark difference from the 1950s when one out of three Americans belonged to one. But although unions are submerging, worker-owned businesses in America are on the rise. Traditional worker-owned cooperatives represent democratic workplaces where each employee has a stake in the financial health of the business. That means each member has one vote in making company decisions. In the new documentary, Shift Change, we see thriving examples of employee-owned businesses in the U.S., like this bakery in San Francisco. Too often I thought people who were working in progressive organizations, we were trying to protest other things and stop other things, but we weren't trying to build an alternative to that. And to, to really have a, new, a democratic society, we have to have the people who have the democratic values be able to produce bread and be able to produce bicycles and books and the things that we need. I like having a say in how the business is run. Um, I think that when people share ownership, they, they take ownership. Ownership is the key ingredient in the co-op business model. Shift Chain travels to Mondragon, Spain, where a 50-year-old network of cooperative businesses is the backbone of society. With 84,000 employees and $25 billion in annual revenue, this region around Mondragon has the lowest unemployment in Spain. Ha cambiado el mundo, pero la empresa sigue siendo, sigue funcionando estáticamente con un sistema organizativo y autoritario centralizado como hace 50 o 80 años. Es posible buscar el equilibrio entre ser empresas rentables y tener como fin último crear riqueza en la sociedad. Ese es el futuro no solamente cooperativo, sino también de cualquier tipo de empresa moderna del siglo XXI. At the AFL-CIO headquarters in Washington, D.C., a panel of guests spoke of the importance of supporting cooperatives as a way to provide a pathway to long-term economic stability. If you look around the country, uh, there's the Bank of North Dakota, which is a public bank. There is a movement building up which is changing and democratizing the ownership of wealth. Co-ops are some of the most important part of that. Directly owned cooperative structures historically have been the key. And there's 130 million people involved in co-ops in the United States today. A large percentage of those in credit unions. One person, one vote, banks, if you like. And there are two things driving it. One is the large-scale pain that people are feeling. Nothing else is working for many people. And I think that's why you're seeing the experimentation and the development. And I think that's why you're going to see more of it. And at the other level, people tend to forget uh, nationalization has just happened in the United States because of crisis. We took over the Chrysler com company, the, we bailed out General Motors, AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, was nationalized by the United States government. So there are different forms of democratization popping up for different reasons. In these cases, we've sold them back as soon as they, they made a public on the, made a profit on the public money. But in future, we may see much larger transformations of this kind as well. Uh, Famously, already in the state of Alaska, oil revenues are used by the state to give everyone a, a dividend as a matter of right. It's a, another form of democratizing ownership. So if you look below the surface, it's not just co-ops, though co-ops are probably the most important developing form. It is not inevitable that this will move forward positively and powerfully, but it's also not inevitable that it will stay at the margins. And I think that's partly a question of whether people take it very seriously and begin seeing it strategically as part, of, part and parcel of developing the basis of, of maybe the next kind of wave of the American economy. The call for the next wave of the American economy is being heard by some established unions like United Steelworkers. International President Leo Girard says this organization now has a strategic alliance with the Mondragon Cooperative. I think it's important to find a new way of doing business that's going to uh, have a greater reward to workers, not just in the economics of work, but in the dignity of work, and we think that that was a really good model to work from. Now, after the most recent right-to-work legislation was passed in Michigan, which further undermines unions by allowing workers not to pay dues, Gerard says he recognizes that times are changing. I think that the unfortunate attack on workers and on trade unions has led us to the greatest income inequality that we've had since the Great Depression. And clearly that economic model has not been working for workers for more than 30 years now. 
Though cooperatives have gotten people working, professor of York University in Toronto, Sam Gindin, says co-ops have their limitations. When you're operating within a capitalist society, it puts severe limits on you. It puts enormous pressure on you to survive. You have to compete. And we, you know, we've seen examples of that historically. So that's one problem, that you're operating within a capitalist society that puts enormous pressure on you uh, to compete on their terms. The other problem is that they're still very marginal because they're trying to operate um, outside of taking power where it is. So if you're looking at credit unions, for example, they're operating in the context uh, of uh, leaving the financial system, the bulk of it, uh, to the banks and investment houses. I mean, any, any uh, bank in the United States, any major bank in the United States is larger than all the co-ops put together. Co-ops can really only work in a sustained way, you know, other than just being marginal and doing some progressive things. Uh, but, but to really work, they have to be part of a transformative project. They have to actually be part of a political movement that is transforming society and, this, and that the co-ops themselves are only one part of that. Gindin worked 20 years in the Canadian Auto Workers Union and acknowledges that unions still have not been able to address the vacuum in the labor movement. In short, he says, workers have to lead the fight. The public sector workers, for example, uh, they're getting hammered today, and they're not going to survive unless they can show that they're the leaders in the fight for public services. The private sector workers are getting hammered. Uh, even when there's subsidies that workers support for companies, it turns out that that doesn't guarantee their jobs. So workers have to think about, what's an alternative? How might we actually convert auto plants so that we use those skills for making uh, the kinds of things we're going to need in the rest of the century around the environment. Now, once you start talking about those larger things and fitting co-ops into that kind of a model, then I think you're beginning to think about what change really means and how these different pieces fit into it. For The Real News Network, Jessica Devereaux, Washington.